Hey, it's Chris here. I wanted to share some thoughts about WWDC 25, the things that excite me the most, and I want to hear from you as well. So first up, let's talk about liquid glass. And this was predicted before WWDC 25, but I didn't get to see it in action. So you never saw these animations. You didn't see the videos of how it would actually look. It was all just rumors. I got to say, I really, really like it. And from what I hear on the internet, people are divided. Some people are saying they don't like it because it's really hard to read the text especially from notifications and things like that. What I will say about that is that this is a developer beta. And so I think these things are going to get ironed out before the official release. And then there's the other camp who really, really love it. I think I'm in that camp at least until I see how it performs with my iPhone because I have a pretty old iPhone. I'm trying to wait until the next redesign. That's when I'm going to upgrade. But from what they showed, liquid glass on the recent devices, it looks really good. And I'm sure it's going to be more intensive on the battery and compute power. I'm just not sure that my old iPhone can handle it. Luckily, they're going to have fallbacks. So not everybody has to have this sort of liquid glass on their phone. Now, the other thing that came to mind I was worried about is for developers. How are we going to adopt our new apps to use liquid glass? And luckily, SwiftUI, it looks like they're updating all of the stock out of the box controls to have this glass look. It's following the new design direction. And I think that's going to be awesome. But developers have a lot of custom views that they've built in apps. And for that, you're going to have to tweak them. And they have also provided liquid glass modifiers that you can add to add some of these effects to your custom controls and custom views. So hopefully that's a smooth process. But all in all, I really do like the new design language. Everything looks better, in my opinion, like this tab bar looks way better than the old one. But I think the star of the show is the foundations model framework. Actually, before we move on to there, there's this. Did anyone else get fooled by this guy? He was the lead designer on this whole Apple redesign initiative for liquid glass. And he tweeted that he was fired on June 9th. And all of the journalists and the news outlets, they they latched onto this story and I kind of got fooled, but he did say that he was joking. So it was just satire. All right. But I totally got fooled. And for a moment, I was like, oh no, what's going to happen? <laughs> Anyways, let's talk about foundations model framework. That's a really confusing name. I feel like that should be updated. For those of you that don't know, this is an API for developers to access the on device LLMs. So that means that you can use AI capabilities without connecting to third party services like OpenAI or Anthropic to do things like summarization, text extraction, image generation, things like that. If you think downstream, that means that you can have offline AI enabled apps, which is really, really exciting because I know a lot of people who are hesitant on using AI for their professional work, let's say, because of client data. They don't want to share this information because who knows what's going to get exposed? Who knows what OpenAI really is doing with the data? Who knows if they're storing it securely? But with this foundation models framework, you can build apps and you can advertise, say that your app, everything stays local on device, right? Transcription, summarization, you know, create bulleted notes of your meeting transcript all happens on device then that's going to give people that peace of mind and it's going to capture a new portion of people who have been waiting on the sidelines and hesitant to jump on AI. And also the other benefit is that you don't have to pay for it as a developer, right? Because right now getting an open AI API key, each time that gets used, you are paying for it. With this, it's free because it's using the on-device LLM. So it remains to be seen how good it is because I haven't gotten a chance to test it yet. I'm still playing around with the betas and getting to it. But in terms of using it from a development standpoint, it's actually not that many lines of code. You just create a session and then you can write your prompt and then you just send it to your session and that's it. So really, really cool stuff. The other cool thing is if you have played with connecting to OpenAI, you will have encountered this, but when the model gives you back your output from your prompt. How do you structure that data so that you can actually use it in your app? Right, that's something you also have to care about. So with this foundation models framework, 
you're able to specify different structs that you create in your project as generable. And then like, oh, actually it tells you right here. And then the model will respond or give you the output in that type. So then your app can use it right away as just instances of that struct. So that's really, really cool as well. That's really, really efficient. So I'm excited about this. I actually think this is the game changer. I know like for most people, the public watching WWDC 25, a lot of people said they were like underwhelmed, but I think as a developer, when you see this, you just see it in a different light or right? you see a different opportunity than the general public does. All right, let's talk about Xcode because they added an AI assistant inside Xcode. It's available to play with inside Xcode 26 beta right now. It connects to ChatGPT. You get a free limit per, was it per day or per week or per month? You get some sort of allocation of requests and you can also connect it to other models. So if you have an Anthropic API key, you can connect it to Claude and all those things like that. Now, I'm really excited about this because I have been exploring and using Cursor to much success in building iOS apps. And I've configured Cursor to be an iOS IDE so that I can build the apps and I can run them from here, launch the iOS simulator and things like that. But I find myself, despite using cursor for the AI part, I still find myself going into Xcode to do any hand editing or like searching through the code to understand the, the code and things like that. I still find myself going back to Xcode. So this being integrated inside Xcode, I don't know if it's going to work just as well as cursor. I don't see why not, because it's just connecting to third party models. Anyways, it's got conversation history, so you can roll back. Uh, it's also got this cool Swift playground macro, which I don't know if I can scrub to show you me. It might not be in this session, but you know how playgrounds are a great way to visualize your code and to be able to test your code and visually see things. Well, this playground macro, it's just like inline in the code editor and it allows you to test the output of your code without affecting your project. For example, AI can generate a lot of like weird output and it's hard to test for all those cases depending on what you input. So for example, if you use a playground macro in here, you can simulate feeding the model different data inputs and you can see all of the outputs to make sure that it's what you expect, things like that. So I'm really excited about this inside Xcode. Again, this is kind of like a developer centric thing. The general public watching WDC 25 isn't really going to be excited about this. So I think for, for me as a developer, there is lots of cool things to see, lots of things to get excited about in this presentation. Okay. This last one, everybody can get excited about not just developers. And those are the productivity gains inside spotlight and Siri. The stuff that they were showing, I've never been a shortcuts user, but after seeing the keynote and how they were automating different things, I'm really excited about doing that because I can really see that increasing productivity. And what that means for us as developers is that by using app intents in our app and exposing our app to these system services, it gives more opportunities for our app to pop up and to be used by people because the apps just get buried, right? There's so many apps. Most of them are free to download. People just sort of download them, install them, play around with it once and forget it. But if your app can perform a function, then someone using spotlight like this, whoops, that's not the spotlight one. <laughs> that's spotlight typing something in like that. What are the, they demoed send message, right? SM. And then you can just hit tab and then you can, you can fill those in. So I'm really excited about app intents, both from a user increasing my productivity using shortcuts and spotlight looks way more useful now and B as a developer, having more opportunities to connect my app into the OS level functions. So that's what I'm the most excited about coming from the keynote. 
What about yourself? What have you been playing around with? What do you look forward to? What strikes you as insanely useful, maybe not so useful? Any critiques you might have, comment them below. And I'll see you in the next videos. I'm playing around with the betas. I'm trying some things out. So I'm hoping to record some videos soon about those experiences. All right, thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one.